Vegas Take coming your way live on a Tuesday, 101.5 FM, 7:20 AM. K Don, the talk of Las Vegas. Chris went in for Brian Shapiro, along with JD Sharp. JD, tons of ways, right, that you can follow the show. Many social media outlets and ways that you can uh, be a part. And whether it's not, whether it's a comment, whether it's an opportunity to weigh in. On the topics, there's a lot of ways you can do it. Yeah, Twitter, uh, YouTube, live stream, Facebook. You can go to our website and check out all the content there that we're you know, updating and adding on to every single day. But, yeah, it's, it's very easy to follow the Vegas Take, and, and everything is labeled the Vegas Take. Local attorney Gerald Gillick is joining us here live in studio. We're going to get to him with uh, some of his uh, experiences and stories regarding medical malpractice. But also joining us here live in the studio, our esteemed news anchor, John Schaefer, joining us here on the Vegas esteemed. Take. John, we appreciate the time. Very esteemed. Yeah. <laughs> Probably an understatement. Yes. Revered. 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 Yeah. That's more yeah. I like that better. Yes. Uh, well, one of the pigeons that was caught in December with a cowboy hat glued to its head has died. The local rescue group said Billy the Pidge was weak when she was rescued in December and died on Sunday. She and another pigeon drew national attention when they were spotted flying around Las Vegas wearing tiny cowboy hats. So, John, I'm not up to beat on uh, animal uh, abuse laws or anything like that, but uh, is anybody uh, at is risk of being charged or being, uh, you know, uh, yeah, being responsible for this. I don't think they know who glued the hats on, but the I group don't. said that the bird was already sickly when they got it, so they don't think it was the hat. That what, so so, so they, they they glued a hat onto a diseased bird? Yeah, they, did it a, they did it to more than just one bird, so right? There's a all number pigeons of diseased to begin with? Yes. So I, I they, guess so I don't know. You know. They're basically flying rats. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's rough. The MGM Grand and Mandalay Bay have been sold. According to MGM Resorts International, the $2.5 billion deal is the second major venture between MGM Resorts and Blackstone Real Estate Income Trust in the past three months. Operation of the resorts will remain in the hands of MGM Resorts International and continue as normal. Yeah, I'm sure that's the question that a lot of people had because obviously with the switchover of the Hard Rock Hotel now being a virgin property, right. it's going to be, you know, they're going to be a total makeover of that. Nothing's going to change, though, with so, respect so this to MGM Grand. MGM Grand and, and the yeah. Mandalay Bay or just MGM Grand? MGM Grand right. and Mandalay Bay. For $2.5 billion, that's it? Yes. I'm shocked that that number is that low. I am shocked. Well, they're not brand new properties. I just, I mean, but you've got. I'm not up to speed on uh, the exact details of what these values would be as far as you've got a million people visiting a week. I'm sure it's up to, I'm sure it's standard across the board, though, JD. Those are two hotels. I get that. It'd be crazy. But those are two hotels right in the center of the strip, which is probably one of the most profitable streets in America over the course of a year. It's not. I just, I feel like, you know, just considering IBIDA, that 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 pricing to me is very low. JD, I don't have $2.5 billion dangling in my pocket. I'm just saying it's very, it's very worrisome to me that that price was that low. I feel like it'd be more like 10 to 12 and maybe. Maybe Gerald can agree with I me. I would think that uh, if the properties were rolling in that much money, MGM Resorts wouldn't be unloading them all. Exactly. That's <laughs> yeah. that's why I'm very surprised. There's a delay in the installation of the translucent roof at Allegiant Stadium. It is now not expected to be installed until mid-May, which is months later than schedule. Raiders representatives say despite the delay, the stadium is still on track to open on July 31st. The first event is August 16th. That's the key thing. That's the key date, right? July. Because we know there's going to be a lot of functions going on. Obviously, the NFL draft is in April here in Vegas. No plans to have it at Allegiant Stadium. But uh, right. it, it, as long as they're able to get uh, as far as, like, uh, the scheduling of big-time events yeah. later on in the summer, and, and they're good to go. And event. to give you an idea, Raiders Stadium has already sold $500 million in tickets, which is only one-fifth of what the entire MGM Grand and Mandalay Bay sold for. Yeah. So that, that's to give you an idea of, <laughs> of, of why I'm thinking I, the way I am with these numbers. And and I don't care. that, that that's You know, it's, it's, it's not great that that is going to take a little bit longer, but that's the coolest stadium in the United States. I mean that's that is that is the best in my opinion the best looking professional sports venue in the United States and I am elated to have it. John Schaefer, news anchor here at KDWN, always appreciate the time, John, and get a Anytime. chance to come in and uh, chat with us. And uh, I'm sure look, I don't think John Schaefer is too happy that uh, Kurt Warner was not included in that top eleven JD of the uh, greatest college football players as a running back. That's fine, Kurt Warner, star player back in the day. Way before your time. Well, you're, 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 talk, you're talking you and I quarterback, right? No, I'm talking number, number, number no, 13. I'm talking Kurt Warner running back <laughs> at, at Penn State. Won a Super Bowl. Superstar in the NFL. For the Rams. Running back back in the 80s. Just before your time. Oh, yeah, Kurt. Yeah, with, back when with, I was in school. With, yeah. a, with a C. Back when you were in school, yeah. Kurt Warner with a C. Kurt Warner with a C. Yeah. C-U-R-T. Oh, okay, yeah. I got you. Yeah. Thanks, John. Appreciate yep. it. Vegas Thanks State lot, coming away live on a Tuesday. Chris Wynn in for Brian Shapiro along with J.D. Sharper. Live here in studio. 
with a, a attorney, Gerald Gillick. He has uh, a, a tremendous career when it comes to uh, medical mal- malpractice, and uh, and we really appreciate you spending some time on a Tuesday with us, Gerald. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gerald. Yeah, thank you. No, I'm pleasure to be here. Yeah, we've uh, of course, uh, you know, you think about medical malpractice, and it's it's you, a lot of times you'll get some strange stories, right? And uh, uh, we were just uh, made aware of one through the, through the Las Vegas Review Journal, just updated uh, back on January 3rd, where we had a Las Vegas dentist, Gerald, that set a five-year-old girl's mouth on fire while she underwent a routine dental procedure, uh, a lawsuit uh, filed this week alleges. Uh, apparently about a year ago, the Las Vegas girl's parents took the child to Just for Kids Dentistry and Orthodontics, had multiple crowns placed in her teeth. And uh, when the dentist uh, used a tool known as a diamond bird to smooth the girl's teeth out while she was under an and emitted a spark that caused a throat pack in the girl's mouth to ignite and produce a fire that lasted one to two seconds. Uh, this is according to a lawsuit filed by other attorneys. This was a strange case to even hear about. And uh, I'm sure this is something that uh, in your line of work you come across all the time. Obviously not specifically to this case because you're not involved with it. But uh, I'm sure you've you've been involved in certain situations that are very much along the same par as this. Well, I I think that uh, I've been doing this for just a little over 45 years, mm-hmm. and uh, you think you've seen everything until you see the next one come in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, a lot of times you'll see cases that are extremely unusual where there may be a complete lack of documentation in a hospital chart, or there may be a complete documentation in a hospital chart with no action. Uh, We just completed one, for example, where a five-day-old baby uh, went into the hospital. Uh, They did a a stent in his leg to provide access, and his foot started turning gray. Then his foot started turning purple. Then his foot started turning black. Then his leg started turning purple. Then his leg started turning black. And over a period of 17 hours, not one single thing was done to determine what was causing the lack of circulation to the foot. And so the foot ended up getting amputated. So you, that case is completed and, and finished now. And so you say, well, gee, that was a very unusual situation. Then a case similar to the dentist case you have comes right. in the office where a five-year-old girl goes in at, to a, have a dental student at um, the university dental school was going to do a procedure on her mouth, and they had an anesthesiologist come in, and the girl starts bleeding from her eye. Then she starts bleeding from her nose, and they continue with the procedure. They don't stop to see what's going on, and now that uh, five-year-old's in a constant vegetative state with hypoxic brain injury, which is permanent. So J.D.'s been here for a few years. I've been here for almost 17 years. Yeah, I, I moved here and, in May of 17. Yeah, and so, you, and, and so there, there's, you think about Las Vegas, obviously everybody thinks about the gambling, and think, you know, it, has, it has a certain image. Right, it has a certain image of being on the shady side in all aspects of life. So, it, it, to me, uh, do you think that kind of extends to the medical industry? I mean, do you think that Las Vegas has a stigma more so than maybe your, you know, your concern, your your midwestern city, you know, like Milwaukee or Chicago or Indiana, or or do you, do you think Las Vegas is kind of a I don't want to be completely disrespectful well, 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 and say well, well, it's a magnet. No, but what, what you're saying is do you for, think that Las Vegas doesn't carry a lot of respect in the medical community? Well, no, no. I, I'm world. Saying, what I'm saying is, is do you think that there are that, that there is more people here that are that shouldn't be accredited physicians or, you know, people in that industry in, in Las Vegas as opposed to other parts of the country? Well, I think overall we have a, a series of really good doctors here, mm-hmm. but we do have a group of doctors, and we do have doctors that come in here that have come from other states where they've had issues, and uh, we have uh, doctors that will practice over a period of years and then all of a sudden shut the practice down and leave, and they'll leave a trail behind them. Yeah. Uh, we do have a certain amount of that. I think that uh, what you have to understand is that in medical malpractice, 10% of the doctors account for 90% of the malpractice. So, for example, I'm dealing with a situation now with a neurosurgeon who have, I've got eight cases mm-hmm. against the same neurosurgeon, all of them similar, all of them involving paralysis and uh, people that are going to have a certain degree of uh, be paralyzed either in both extremities, one extremity, or uh, their lower abdomen. So, but it's all the same neurosurgeon. Uh, and then we have other neurosurgeons that are the ones that refer me the cases because they say, hey, this is, a, this is not right because they have a great deal of pride in their profession. Oh, and sense. so yeah. they want it cleaned up. 
And uh, so it's not unusual to see one doctor, uh, either a neurosurgeon or one OBGYN. But part of our problem here is that the doctors are seeing too many patients. Uh, yeah. For example, uh, there are doctors that don't do any follow-up at the hospital after a surgery. I have one uh, case where a lady went in for a uh, plastic surgery, and the doctor did five procedures in one day. She was in the operating room nine hours. He left the facility at 4 p.m. At 4.30 p.m., the woman was discharged home with a high amount of narcotics on board, and she died in her sleep at her house uh, less than five hours later at home. So you see no follow-up there. They didn't. They left the facility, and uh, they said to the nurse, you know, when she can count her fingers, send her home. And so are, are they seeing too many patients because, I mean, is, is that kind of, a, are you kind of condemning health care and, and what's going on with as far as insurance in the United States, or why is that? Well, that's not a simple question to answer, but the okay. Reader's Digest version is that I, I think the majority of uh, our problems are related to companies like United Healthcare, who and, who insures eighty percent of the bodies here in Las Vegas, probably, and um, their reimbursements are alarmingly low. For example, you you have a copay. You might pay a copay going in of twenty five dollars. Mm-hmm. So you would think, oh, gee, the the insurance company is probably paying fifty or sixty or seventy. Well, from what I've heard from some of the physicians, the insurance company is paying twelve. way less than your copay. And if the doctor waives waives the copay, the insurance company doesn't have to pay the reimbursement. So uh, as a result, let's say in 1999, a doctor was seeing 25 patients a day, an OBGYN. Now they're seeing 40 or 45. And you get five minutes with the doctor. One case came in just recently. Well, not that recently, but uh, the doctor was doing a follow-up after he had done a cesarean, and he washed out the girl's incision, mm. and he used acid instead of saline. Oh, my God. And so uh, the woman has a permanent scarring of her abdomen now for the rest of her life, and she's 32 years old. So, I mean, that that kind of thing. I mean, acid has a smell. Yeah. And if you just put it on your sponge and all of a sudden you whap it on the stomach— mm. You haven't done what you're supposed to do. Gerald Gillick joining us here live in studio. He's an attorney, specializes in medical malpractice here in the Vegas Take. I'm Chris Wynn in for Brian Shapiro along with J.D. Sharp. So Vegas has roughly, we'll call it 2.5 million metropolitan. I believe mm-hmm. that, you know, they're saying 50,000 are moving here a year from California. I was at the DMV, I think, two days ago. There was a line. They were all there? There was a line 300 people long. Yeah. There's five DMVs. They're packed all day long. There's 100,000 yeah. plus moving to Vegas every year. We're going to hit 3 million quickly. In relation, you know, as far as you know, a, a city with 2.5 million people, would you say that Vegas has more medical malpractice cases than another city in the United States? On a per capita basis, I don't know, but I do know that in Nevada we have what is known as a cap on non-economic damages. So a lot of attorneys won't take cases because there's a limit on how much they can they can uh, recover for cases where there's a brain damage or cases where someone's permanently paralyzed. We have a $350,000 cap. So the, there was an attempt here years ago to give the doctors a free pass. And basically, they've given the doctors pretty much of a free pass by putting that cap in place. If you get hit by a Beacon's moving truck, you could recover $5 million, $2 million. If you're paralyzed, you get paralyzed by a doctor, you got three fifty. dollars So uh, we have, as a result of that cap, we don't have a lot of what I call accountability. Mm-hmm. because a doctor doesn't have a lot of skin in the game. He's got a million-dollar insurance policy. And uh, so he doesn't have to worry about his kid's college education or he doesn't have to worry about his house. He doesn't have to worry about anything. Right. So uh, as a result, uh, we do have some doctors, needless to say, that I think uh, are not res- are not doctors that you would want to have in your community. And so it's kind of like almost having an LLC, right, where you have limited liability. Correct. And most doctors practice under an LLC in addition to, so they'll have an LLC and hospitals use contract nurses, for example. Uh, And as a result, they don't have to pay health benefits. They don't have to pay retirement. They don't have to pay vacations. They use a traveling nurse service or a contract nurse service. And so as a result, we have a lot of nurses who don't have what I call the dedication we used to see. 
you know. Mm. And uh, I had a case not too long ago where a patient was taken to uh, X-ray. He was uh, in a wheelchair with oxygen, and on the way back to the, his room, uh, he died because there was no oxygen in the bottle. There you have it. That's it. That's no good. So, look. There, obviously, a number of these cases are absolutely legitimate, right? And they're they're going to get end up with settlement. They're or they're going to end up being taken care of. But Gerald, I have to ask you this because we're in Vegas. There's a lot of people that are looking for the payout, right? They're looking for the immediate. How many times do you and your colleagues get your time wasted by people that come into your offices and they pitch something to you and it's complete BS? It's just completely something that is going to go nowhere fast. And well, it's just an opportunity where they're looking to make some money. Okay, that's really a good question, and I'll tell you why I like to address that question. Mm-hmm. Number one, uh, in medicine, a bad result isn't necessarily negligence. Right. So if you have a bad outcome of a surgery or something, it doesn't mean the doctor necessarily did something wrong. But uh, at the same time, I don't think you will ever see a frivolous medical malpractice case filed, one they call mm-hmm. frivolous, yeah. because, number one, the patients can't pay the – you can't file a case without another doctor saying that the other doctor did something wrong. Right. You have to have that doctor's affidavit before you can even file in court. That costs between $5,000 and $25,000. Mm-hmm. So what attorney is going to file a frivolous medical malpractice case and put his money in there as an advance on those costs uh, thinking that, hey, you know, I put my dry cleaning pants in and they ruined them, so I want $5 million, you know, or I got burned by coffee. The McDonald's case has done an awful lot to destroy credibility of litigation, but um, it's something people say, oh, we got frivolous malpractice cases. When I'm selecting a jury, I will say to the jury, okay, let's talk about frivolous cases. I'll say, now, how many know about the McDonald's coffee case? Everybody raises their hand. I say, anybody else? What about another frivolous case? Well, they, they're they not real sure. I say, okay, there's 10,000 cases across the United States filed every day. You've come up with two that are frivolous. Now, do you have a – do you think that – because I'll ask them first. Do you think there are too many frivolous cases? Their hands always go up. But then when you ask them, give me a name of one or give me a subject matter, they're not there. So it's basically – propaganda, insurance companies control a lot of what's said out there. And you may remember, if you've been here a lot of years, Mm -hmm. that in 2002, 2004, the insurance companies showed doctors going across the desert, Mm -hmm. hiking to other states. They showed them delivering babies in ambulances. And uh, so the medical malpractice arena, if you can use that word, right. Uh, has really had its difficulties in terms of selecting juries that are open-minded. Because you'd think that's something that would raise its head, given and not just in medical malpractice, just in you know in in legal work in general. Right. Given we're in Las Vegas, where you have all these resorts and properties, where you know somebody wants to slip and fall or wants to, you know what I mean? Oh, like, of course. It, 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 it all seems the time. like it's something that could be very prominent in a town so like this. So this this is really I'm going to go back to this this cap. This is really troubling. So my, I have a daughter. She's she's she turned two years old on uh, December twentieth. And you're telling me that if if the OBGYN who delivered my daughter had somehow messed up and she had died, I could only receive, I could only recover $350,000 in damages from that? That's exactly what I'm telling you. And, for example, if a man's wife dies and she wasn't producing income for the family, the most he could receive, even if she had four kids, would be 350000 I had a case where uh, a, a wife, unemployed wife died with left four kids and a husband, and so I wanted to follow it all the way through just to see. And at the end, the kids got $12,000 each and the husband got twenty-four. So that's because the cap is self-destroying. It's like mm-hmm. the old Pac-Man game. The longer it goes, the costs come out of it. So if, if a, an attorney has to hire five doctors, that's 60000 That comes out of the three fifty. dollars yep. So it just kind of eats away at it. So, yeah, you could get three fifty. dollars if it happened to be an insurance company that settles cases. But we have one medical malpractice insurance company here that takes a scorched earth policy and doesn't settle. So you have to litigate that all the way through. And um, that that costs a fortune, and you might end up with 250 because they've got no incentive to settle. They can go to trial, and uh, I have a case right now that's going to trial for the second time. 
and the insurance company just gave me a document the other day that shows that they've spent $349,000 on attorney's fees wow. up to this point, and the case would have settled for $350,000. Five and are, eight are, years ago. Are, are, are you <laughs> yeah, are so. you buying that that they've spent that much money? I'm buying it because the attorneys don't work for any for nothing. And this case mm-hmm. went to the Supreme Court and back for the 350 case. So the the family, or the, if, if the win the win is a thousand dollars, you have your cut obviously, uh, and then the family gets a thousand dollars for that case. Well, and th- no, because the 350 thousand was what the defense has paid to the attorneys that were defending the doctors. That's not right. money I made. I don't make any money until the case is concluded. And it makes sense because it, with this case, with this uh, five-year-old girl here in Las Vegas, uh, the numbers, it's not exactly extra- – we're not talking about she's getting, you know, three hundred and fifty, four hundred thousand dollars 400000 right? I mean, apparently the uh, the suit was seeking uh, like $15,000 no, in that, damages. That, so we're not no, – no, the fifteen. So my point being is they're not getting extravagant amounts of money here you know, for for just, uh, you know, for, for something that is not life-threatening. Well, like, it's not, yeah. The 15000 is not indicative of that. The okay. 15000 is a pleading rule. Mm-hmm. In order to keep attorneys from inflaming the press by filing lawsuits demanding millions of dollars, right. you have oh. to plead a sum in excess of fifteen. That case, if it settles and if the girl has injuries, the maximum that she would receive would be three hundred and fifty thousand. Now, is, oh, wow. but it might not be worth that much. Is, is or that, it might is, be. Is that yeah. a private? Is that a public doctor or a private? Because you can you can hire private doctors if you want. You know, premium healthcare. You can you can hire private consigliers. And I mean, does does that rule apply to? I mean, because if, if I'm let's say that Sheldon Allison has has a, a, a granddaughter and he's worth forty billion dollars, and his granddaughter would, would be you know in line to to receive eight or nine billion dollars over, over the course of the next you know ten or twenty years. And she dies, she goes to a, a routine doctor appointment, and, and she dies for whatever reason, and it's the doctor's fault. Despite the fact that his net worth is that and her earning power was, was you know, significantly more than $350,000, no matter what, all, all he can receive, all, all he can recover out of it, and all her parents can recover out of it is $350,000? That's across the board. That's doctors, dentists, uh, paramedics. It, it's, it applies to nurses. It applies to a very specific uh, therapist. Uh, nursing homes, it applies across the board, the 350000 So there's no, there's going to be no distinction between, say, like a family doctor that has his own personal business as opposed to a doctor that works for a hospital system, for example, where you would think, you would think, right, that that doctor, that surgeon or whatever that works at the hospital, you know, he, he would be, whoever wanted to sue him or, you know, or have a claim against him would get a much larger payoff given, you know, what the capacity of that company is to pay as opposed to like a family doctor. No, it's it's across. It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter. But the yeah. one thing that you you want to uh, I want to point out is that applies to non-economic damages. If okay. a person is employed and can't go back to work and they've lost their job, they've lost their income. For example, I have a case where a 35 year old attorney went into uh, because he's having chest pains, a long history of chest pains. They put him on a treadmill. They misread the treadmill. Uh, and some uh, and a normal report back to the family practitioner, and over his lifetime he would have made nine and a half million dollars because he was a partner in a national law firm, so that would be in addition to the three fifty. Okay, that that now what about p- potential inheritances? Potential inheritance means nothing. So you had to be yeah. gainfully employed at the time and and showing the returns. You have to be able to show that this is a reasonable loss either. And the other economic loss we see, for example, I do a lot of brain damage baby cases where mm-hmm. the babies are brain damaged at birth or have an injury that develops as a result of something done while they're small. And those life care plans are uh, in addition to the 350. I'm unfamiliar with a life care plan. That would be the cost of providing them oxygen, providing them okay. nursing care, 24-hour care, uh, special needs, vans, so forth. That life care, what it needs to, to give them support over the remaining years of their life would be in addition to the 350. Okay, all the additional help that you need. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Attorney Gerald Gillick, he's joining us live here in studio. He is a uh, specialist when it comes to medical malpractice. We're talking about some of the, you know, some of the experiences he's had in the business and some of the uh, kind of you know, strange scenarios that have presented themselves in, in, his, in his line of work and, uh, and uh, kind of expressing that to both J.D. and myself. What is the most bizarre case as far as the fundamentals of it, that, that, that the most bizarre scenario that, you, that you've had to deal with as an attorney in your 45 years of practicing in Las Vegas? Well, actually, 
Uh, I don't know that I can even answer that, except <laughs> I did have a couple of cases back in the 80s where the doctors were, quote, helping people over, uh, and mm-hmm. they were uh, cause, they were injecting ec- uh, excessive amounts of morphine if the person was uh, in intensive care and were causing so like, like assisted dynamic. suicide. Yeah, but Oof. the most bizarre case basically is the five day old baby because there was ninety nine changes in the medical record for one day hospital. Oh wow, Gerald, we appreciate you getting a chance to spend some time on a Tuesday here with us on the Vegas Take and uh, and tell us and giving us the information and stories. Great stuff. Appreciate well, it. I'll come back anytime. Yeah. Uh, Gerald Gillick joining us here live yeah, on the Vegas Take. Thanks a lot, Take. Gerald. JD Sharp, Chris Wynn, back after this.